Hello, Bethel Baptist Church. Thank you so much for tuning in to another week of these videos on church polity. Uh, we've been discussing church polity and how the church is to govern itself, which is what church polity means. Uh, and starting with my videos last week, we made a transition from talking about the congregation to elders, pastors, shepherds, overseers, going to be using those terms synonymously, as I talked about last week. But we've been talking about the congregational authority and what kind of authority that the congregation is supposed to have. And uh, and now we're going to moving into elders. Last week, uh, or last video, I focused in on why elders are important. Uh, why this topic matters for us with elders. And uh, as I said in that video, I think that one of the primary ways in which God demonstrates his love is through proper channels of authority. And so understanding that God has set up a leadership structure in the church, not to uh, push down the church, not to push down people, but instead actually to lift others up, just as a husband's job is to lift up his wife. And, and Jesus, as he serves as authority over the church, is to lift up the church. So elders, uh, they shepherd in Jesus' stead to lift up the church, to build up the church. And so it's a way in which God demonstrates great love to the congregation is by giving the congregation elders. But secondly, I, I noted that uh, what you see a pattern in Scripture is that you become like those you follow. And so uh, knowing who's in leadership and the requirements of those in leadership and what they're to do once they're in leadership is important because you will become like those you follow. Uh, so this week, then, what I want to do is I want to transition a little bit to be talking about the requirements of an elder. Who gets to be an elder? Uh, how do we go through that process of figuring that out? Um, as of now, I, I see in Scripture seven requirements for an elder. I'm going to just go through the first three this week, and then the next four the following week. This may grow. There might be uh, changes throughout, but uh, this is where I'm at right now. And then after I go through the requirements of an elder, um, I, I, I want to explain the duties of an elder. But this week, I want to start with some of the requirements. So let me go through the first three requirements. First, I think that a requirement of an elder is that elders should uh, be a part of a plurality. They should be a part of a plurality, a plurality of pastors. Now, I know what you're thinking. Where is this in the scripture? And I want to be clear here. This is a, a weird one. Um, I wanted to talk about the plurality of eldership. I wasn't sure exactly where to fit it in. So I threw it in as one of the requirements. But I do think that as I thought through it, I, I think that it is helpful uh, because there isn't exactly a requirement of a person individually to be a part of a plurality of elders. Uh, there's nowhere in scripture that it says that I, I, I'm not going to be able to turn anywhere that says that if there isn't multiple pastors, then you can't be a pastor. I am confident there are situations all over the place uh, where there are no other men uh, who can be a pastor. And so you have one guy as a pastor. But specifically in our Southern Baptist model uh, that we've kind of been in is you've got one pastor as the model, and that's typically what you see in a lot of Southern Baptist Church. However, I think that scripturally, that's not the way that God has ordained the church to function. Let me explain. In the, in the Bible, it assumes that there are multiple pastors. So the single pastor leading a church is the exception, not the rule in the Bible. Each time you see pastors brought up or elders brought up in Scripture, it is in the plural. Uh, a few verses would be Acts 14.23, Acts 15.4, Acts 16.4, Acts 20.17, uh, Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, Titus 1.5, 1, 1 Peter 5.1, 1, James 5.14. All of these talk about leadership pastors in the plural. So although I do not think it is necessary that, uh, that there be a plurality for you as an individual to be a pastor, like you couldn't become a pastor of a place unless there was a plurality already established. That's not what I'm saying. It does seem that it is a necessary requirement that a pastor desire a plurality of pastors, that a pastor seeks to 
uh, have more than one pastor. And I think that we can see this in the commands given from Paul to Timothy, that Timothy, as an elder in Ephesus, is to train up other men. He is, he is supposed to be discipling in such a way that there are other men who could at least be pastors, that this is kind of the goal they, there. And so in, in some ways, I do see the scriptural principle, this requirement being that pastors should have other pastors doing the work around them. And if they don't, then they are at least required to be training up other pastors. And so I'm using this kind of requirement here to to do double duty. Uh, The requirement being either there should be a plurality of pastors, but at the same time, there should be a training up of multiple pastors. And I think practically, uh, God has ordained this because as I said in my last video, you look like your leaders. And one thing we know over and over again is that leaders aren't perfect. Uh, They fail all the time. One leader isn't perfect. The only leader that is perfect is Jesus Christ. And so having a multiple uh, group, a a multiplied group of men uh, lead means that you have a lot of different people. And where one leader fails, others might be strong. And so you have a fuller picture of Jesus and his leadership through multiple people. And so you don't get stuck into the sin of one person as you just follow them. And also, I think that this is a beautiful protection for pastors, uh, that there are other people that they have to report to, that me as a pastor, I I shouldn't have uh, authority as an individual, but I have an authority as I am collectively a part of a group as a plurality of pastors. So again, I don't think that a plurality of pastors is necessarily a requirement, like you can't become a pastor until there's a plurality. But if you do not at least desire a plurality or seeking to institute a plurality, there is a problem there because that is the biblical model, that there is a plurality of pastors leading the church, not just one man. This leads to the second requirement then that, and I've I've said the word men over and over again, uh, and the second requirement is that elders should be men. God has ordained that pastors in the church should be males. Paul is clear that a pastor has to be a one-woman man. Uh, Further in the context where he brings this up, it is right after a discussion of uh, men and women in the church. Women are not to exercise authority over men in the church, and men are commanded to lead. And also throughout the pastoral epistles, all through the pastoral epistles, which are uh, 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus, uh, the metaphor that Paul uses to describe the leadership of an elder is a household model. So as a man exercises leadership in his home is similarly to how the church should function. Uh, and so I know that there is a lot of controversy on this subject. What can a woman do and not do in the church? What does this mean? And while that is an important question for what I'm trying to accomplish here, uh, that's not what I'm going to address in this video. I want to be careful that I don't get too far off topic. It is an important topic. It is one that should be uh, addressed and one I expect I will. Um, But what we're talking about is what are the requirements of an elder? And although there's a lot of controversy about what would that look like, what should men and women do in the church, at a baseline, uh, it's very clear from Scripture that pastors are to be men in the church leading, that they are to exercise that leadership. So secondly, elders should be men. Thirdly, Elders should have the right desire, the right desire. I know this might sound a little weird as a requirement, but bear with me. To be an elder, you sort of have to want to be an elder. You have to want it. And there is always a danger I see in the church of this idea of false humility that comes in the church. And it comes off as godliness, but it really isn't. It's it's this mentality that says, I don't want to presume anything that, you know, I don't want to presume this, or uh, I don't want to have selfish ambition. No, 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 I, I can't want to be it. I have to be dragged into this. And if I have this desire, then it must be selfish. It must be sinful. So I can't be an elder if I want it. But scripture is clear that if you don't want to shepherd God's people, then don't shepherd God's people. God doesn't want your obligation. He wants your heart. He wants you to desire to serve him in this way. Now, to be sure, there are two sides of the ditch here. There is a difference. There is godly ambition and ungodly ambition. Uh, You've got one side of the ditch of this ungodly ambition that you fall into. Ungodly ambition is when you want the title for yourself. You want to feel superior. Uh, it's, It's wanting the church simply to be in your own image. It's 
praise and glory for your own name. It's what Paul talks about in Philippians, to be preaching Christ from selfish ambition. These people, they, they, they're only preaching Christ so they can pull other down and, and build themselves up. This is ungodly ambition, and this has no place leading the church. But on the other side, you have this other side of the ditch, which is this false piety uh, that says, if you want it at all, then you're not being very godly. Uh, but Paul, clearly throughout the um, epistles, he had a desire to hold on to his apostleship. This was given to him, and not only that, but he wanted to use his apostleship for the good of the church. He wanted to use his position to glorify God in the church and uh, he was excited to do so. He joyfully did so. And, and we see multiple passages that discuss this. In 1 Timothy 3, 1, it says, The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires or desires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. You are supposed to want to be an elder. Hebrews thirteen seventeen says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning. For that would be of no advantage to you. Leaders are not supposed to complain about being leaders. They aren't supposed to say, well, God forced me into it. I just had to do it. They are to lead the church with joy. They aren't to be groaning about it. Uh, your leaders are supposed to be excited that they get the opportunity to be your leaders. They have a disposition of joy. First Peter 5, 2, uh, Peter says this to the elders. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock, not under compulsion. This isn't, being a leader isn't something that you should be dragged into kicking and screaming, but it is something that you willingly submit to. You don't shepherd as if you have a chip on your shoulder, then you have something to prove that you've got to do this, that, uh, Instead, it's a joy. I can't believe that I would be chosen for such a noble task, that the Lord would allow this to happen, that he would allow me to shepherd in this way. This kind of language reminds me of Israel's law in, in Deuteronomy chapter 20, when God, the people of Israel, to go out to war, and uh, God gives stipulations. He, he says, hey, if you've built a house uh, but haven't dedicated it, then go back to your house. If you planted a vineyard but you haven't enjoyed any of it, then go back to your house. If you are betrothed to a wife but you haven't married her and been able to enjoy your wife, then go back and, and be with your wife. If you are fearful, fearful or afraid, uh, then go back because uh, we don't want you messing up the ranks of the army. And, and the basic idea is this. Yes, you were called into military service, but if you don't want to do it, then don't because it's not actually helpful. The Lord, and this is this idea of false power, the Lord doesn't need you to shepherd his people. He doesn't need anyone to shepherd his people. He can do it himself. And so the fact that somebody might be called and desiring and wanting uh, to shepherd in this way um, is, a, is a really beautiful thing. And, and so if you don't want to be an elder, don't be both. So we need to be careful of both sides of the ditch here. A false ambition and a false piety. Uh, elders are to have right desires. Not any desire to be an elder. There are some desires for eldership that are wrong and evil and God is against. But you can't have no desire to be an elder uh, because no desire isn't what the Lord requires either. Okay, that was the first three requirements that an elder should be seeking a plurality, that an elder should be a man, and, and that an elder should have a right desire for the office. We're going to finish the next four in the following week. I hope that this was a helpful for you as you think through this topic. Uh, as always, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me at my email. It is marty, M-A-R-T-Y, at bbckc.org. Again, that's marty at bbckc.org. Thanks so much for watching, and I will see you soon.